Hallelujah. Why don't we give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. We have some uh, prayer requests we want to bind together for for just a few moments. Bring these needs to the Lord today. I want to pray, continue to pray for uh, Sister Pamela Adcock. Pray that the Lord would uh, touch her body, bring her strength, um, help her through a, a difficult time. The Lord uh, is able. He's able to heal no matter what infirmity we're facing. So I want to pray for pray for Sister Adcock. Uh, Sister Barbara's in need of prayer. I want to lift her up in prayer this morning. Uh, Shepherd Spit, Smith is in need of a touch today. And uh, Kat Griffith, I want to pray for her this morning. Amen. Amen. If you have a need in your life, if you'll just signify by the uplifted hand, needs all over this house, let's stand and go before the Lord together in His presence. Lord Jesus, we love You, mighty God. Lord, we're so very grateful for this opportunity that you've given us once again to come into your presence today, O oh God. Lord, we thank you for this time of Bible study, Lord, that we can get into your word. Lord, break the bread of life, Lord, and grow from it. Glean from your word here today, Lord. Every need that we have, Lord, we, we give it to you, Lord. Every need is subject to your wonderful holy name, Jesus. Touch those that are hurting, those in need of healing in their body, Lord. No matter the sickness, no matter the struggle, Lord, we know that you're able to supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory, mighty God. Move in the miraculous once again. Minister to our hearts today, Lord. Your word is anointed, and we thank you for it today, Lord. Anoint our hearts to be receptive of it, Lord. And we're quick to give you the praise and the honor and the glory that you're so very worthy of. Why don't you give the Lord a hand clap of praise today? Hallelujah. Lord, we pray all these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You can be seated today. Lord bless you. Amen. Amen. I had... Uh, uh, a very wonderful time uh, uh, sharing my heart last Wednesday, and I did say that, uh, uh, and a couple of people reminded me of that today, and I'm, I'm glad, so maybe there's some expectation, and uh, um, Zoe asked me after, after uh, church on Wednesday, we, we got something to eat after church, went on home, and, and she said, so you said you're not bringing anything, but are you really bringing something? And I said, I'm absolutely not bringing anything. We're, it'll be an object lesson, but you can just imagine you know, bugs and badgers, if you will. So this, this, I guess, would be part two. I've never, I've never really done anything like that, but there was just so much information, and I wanted to, I wanted to share this and do a little bit of a breakdown. It's really good to have our uh, seafarer crowd back with us this morning. Amen. We hadn't we hadn't forgot brother and sister Lee at all. So so grateful that they were able to go and have a wonderful time. We were down here at the church doing a little bit of work yesterday, and uh, uh, they come bebopping in and look very rested, just in a wonderful uh, wonderful uh, disposition. They were just excited and had some great stories. You'll have to ask him about uh, his karaoke experiences. <laughs> Spoiler alert: he didn't do a lot of singing. But he did some watching, so that's, that's all a lot of fun. So I'm so glad they, they're back with us. Had a wonderful time this week. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to turn your attention to the Scripture that, uh, that we read from, the Scripture text uh, last Wednesday, uh, Proverbs chapter 30, and uh, verse number 24. And I'm just going to read this again and dive into it a little bit. I want to share what the Lord's laid on my heart today. Um, Proverbs 30 and 24, the Bible says, there be four things which are little, somebody say little, little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet Make they their houses in the rocks. Verse number 27 says, The locusts have no king, but go they forth, all of them by bands. Verse number 28, The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Amen. Amen. What's bugging you? 
See what I did there? It's kind of clever. If you don't remember anything, you'll probably remember that. What's bugging you this morning? Second Peter chapter 1 says this, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's 2 Peter 1 and 21. And 2 Timothy 3 and 16 says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So here we have the Word of God is God-given. The Word of God is God-given. That's not uh, a hard thing for anybody of faith to accept. I, um, I make it a point when I study. I heard somebody say this a long time ago, and I've, I've worked it into something that I say um, when I study. And, and when I study, I, I study in good faith, and I ask the Lord to, um, to, to maintain in my heart a, a student perspective. I, I, I don't want to fail to be a student of the Word of God. I, I want to learn. Every time the Word of God is open, I want to learn from the Word of God. And, and I say what I heard years ago, and I pray when I, when I read Scripture, Lord, illuminate your Word to me. Make it known to me. I want to be a student of the Word of God because the alternative of that is trying to fit Scripture into our narrative. And it doesn't work that way. I want to follow the Word of God. I don't want the Word of God following Matt Smith. So I, I, I make a good faith effort, effort when I study, and, and sometimes I'll, I'll look at things, and, and maybe I've looked at it wrong, and I studied a little bit deeper, and, and I have a, 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 a more full and a more rich understanding. I think some people, some people have a different opinion of this. I think that it's a wonderful thing to have some different translations when you read, to fully understand and to shore up Scripture in your heart and in your mind as you read. King James is wonderful, and I love it, but sometimes I don't understand the these and nows and I want to understand what God is trying to speak to my heart and so I asked the Lord to illuminate his word to me I said something on Wednesday night that um, and I left room for error because there was and I said something on Wednesday night that I do want to correct I said that uh, traditionally the book of Proverbs was um, was um, said that it was uh, King Solomon that was uh, credited for writing most of the Word of God. In fact, if you read in Proverbs 1 and 1, it says this very thing, the wisdom of Solomon. But in doing a little bit deeper dive, our, our portion of Scripture that we read, there was uh, in Proverbs 30 and 31, there's two s separate individual expressly... Uh, named and credited men that wrote these specific uh, chapters. And so I just wanted to, I wanted to put a correction on that, and I think it's very important that we go into the word, reading of God's Word and, with a good faith effort to learn and to know exactly what it says. So the Bible says, in fact, the very beginning of chapter 30, it says the, the writer of this, and it was the God-directed words of a man named Agur, A-G-U-R, Agur. Nothing else of Agor is mentioned in Scripture, but as uh, is with the other Proverbs throughout the book of Proverbs, Agor reveals great wisdom in his observations. Just as Solomon had, so did Agor, and it was tremendous wisdom that he shares. And he does this while maintaining a sense of deep personal humility and dependence upon God for understanding. He says this, I am among all people brutish. If we were to put it in our, our present day language, that would be like saying, I'm stupid. I'm stupid. I don't know nothing. I worked with an, an older fellow that um, he was brilliant. And he would talk to young guys like that, and, and he would try to get them to understand what they're working on. And he'd say, I'm stupid. I don't know nothing, so you need to explain it to me. And he was a real aggressive kind of guy. And, and I'm like, well, I didn't call him stupid. But Agor calls himself this. He said, among all people, I'm brutish. I'm, I, I know nothing without God revealing it to me. So with, with humility, he says, it is a God-given revelation and understanding. Wisdom comes from God, and he understood his place in all of that. 
with humility, maintaining personal humility and dependence on God. Agor mentions four things in his writing that at the onset seem great, but are really despicable and loathsome. And by contrast, he goes into speaking of great and exceeding wisdom that's observed in the small things. See, these big things turned out to be not so good, but it's these small things that we glean this wonderful wisdom. And uh, we talked about the first two ants. Ants are a people lacking in strength, but tremendous in diligence. They work when it's time to work. When it's time to go to work, they work. The conies or the rock badgers are vulnerable creatures, and they embrace their dependence upon greater and stronger things. They run to the rock. They run to the rock. Who in here needs to run to the rock, Christ Jesus? I know I do. So we carry on with this, and we look at the last two uh, th observations that, that Agor makes about these small things on the earth. The locusts, the Bible says that they, they have no direction or director. They have no king, yet they band together or they work together. They go forth in bands. They have no director, but they work, somebody say, together. In the book of Joel, the prophet gives word to Judah about the destruction that they face that is brought on by their sin. The prophet Joel speaks some very hard truths to the people of Israel, the, the, the tribe of Judah specifically, and he, he talks of the destruction that they see all around them that is devastating them. And he speaks as directed by God. He gives them this prophetic word. And, and, and with this strong word, he also gives them a, an opportunity to turn from their wickedness, to turn from that. And, and, and as we read and study the book of Joel, you see this. But he gives these very strong, um, this very strong word of destruction that is coming against the, the people of God. The destruction is spoken of as palmer worm, canker worm, caterpillar, and locust. Somebody say locust. locust. Which the Lord, later in the book of uh, Joel, he refers to them as his great army. He refers to them as his great army. The Hebrew words that are used in the original for palmer worm, canker worm, caterpillar, and locust are actually, that they're used for all four of these creatures are all references to locusts. So there's a little bit in translation that, that it seems as though that these were different creatures or species of creatures altogether, but it's actually the Hebrew words or some form or reference to locusts, all four of those, in its various stages of development. Now there's a reason I'm, I'm bringing all this out, and I think it's very important that we understand this. Palmer worm, canker worm, caterpillar, and locusts, but these are all references to locusts in its various stages of development, some without wings, some unable to fly away, some just kind of crawling around, some fully developed, some very small. Um, the Amplified Bible uses a, a more direct translation to the words that are used in Hebrews, swarming, creeping, stripping, and devouring or gnawing. Those are the words that are used to describe this great army of God. These locusts, this great army of God. At the Lord's command, He can call on this great army of locusts to wage war on His enemies. How do I know this? Because He did it before. In Egypt. At God's command, he called the locusts to go and to, to wage war on the enemies of God in the land of Egypt. That all locusts at differing levels of development. Please stay with me today. I really want you to, to receive what I, what I feel like the Lord's laid on my heart. At different levels of development, working in chorus with one another, 
are mighty and impactful to the fulfillment of God's will. This is the beauty of the church. We're together. We're together. We don't always think the same about everything. Does anybody, does anybody believe that today? You ever had a conversation with me? I'm different than you. You're different than me. Thank God. Thank God for that. Thank you, Lord, for that. We don't all have the same abilities. We don't all view things the same way. We don't all do the same things. We are all at different stages of development, even in our walk with God. Maybe you've been a part of this your whole life, and that's wonderful. Maybe you're a third or fourth generation on both sides of your family and this is all you've ever known. Maybe you were the first or the only one in your family to turn their heart to the Lord. Maybe this is all brand new to you. But the wonderful thing about all of that is we are here, somebody say, together. Together. You bring something different to the table than I bring to the table. Thank God for that. Thank God for diversity in the church. Thank God for people putting their hands together to the plow, working for the things of God that have a different perspective and a different take and a different outlook. But we all come together with a common denominator of our faith. We need Jesus today. We might have different ways of thinking. We might have different ways of doing. We might have different ways of acting. But all of us this morning can agree that we need Jesus. Hallelujah. Together, together in unity, our faith is the common denominator here today. We are different, but we are together. I want to tell you there's nothing more powerful than when people come together, when we put our differences aside. Yeah, I look at it a little bit different than than you do, but that's okay. We're going to go to heaven together. We're going to save our families together. We're going to reach our communities together. We're going to lift our hands and lift our voices, and we're going to worship together. You may have had a bad morning, and you may have had a great morning, but we're going to lay that aside for a little while, and we're going to come together in unity and lift our hands and lift our voices. And worship God together. Why don't we do that right now, church? Together. Together. Different stages of development in our walk. Different ages. Different ages. You might be a grandparent here today. You might be very young. You might be a grandparent that thinks you're very young. And I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> but age just means life's experiences. We're all at different places. We're at different parts of our journey. But we're together. We're together. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible says this. Verse number, verse number 12. It says, for as the body is one, somebody say one, One. and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. And if you skip down to verse number 26, and it says, whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Oh, that's so powerful. That's so powerful. They say misery likes company. That's not really, that doesn't apply to me. When I'm down and out, I want someone to be there with me to encourage me through it. When I'm suffering, I know that i got a church that's going to be with me in my suffering. When you're suffering, friend, I'm going to be there with you when you're hurting. That's what we need. We need to depend on one another. We are one body of Christ. It goes on to say, Or when one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. There is nothing more wonderful than when somebody gives a wonderful testimony of the goodness of God and everybody claps their hands or everybody shouts or everybody gets excited because when one is blessed, we're all blessed when we hear about it because we are together. Together. 
We mourn together. We rejoice together. We work. We fight. We struggle. And we triumph together, church. Praise God. Praise God. Because we have weaknesses, we must strengthen one another. We must. We must depend on one another. I was at work one day and I was calling a young man and he didn't answer. One of our apprentices. And I called him a few times and he didn't answer. I thought, man, that's not like him. I was really needing some help. And uh, I went out to my vehicle to go get something. And I looked down the road in the plant and I saw his truck. And I thought, man, what? there's nothing to work on over there. And so I, I walked over, put my hard hat on, and I walked over to where he was, and I, I walked up to his truck, and I realized why he wasn't answering. He was asleep. Can I be honest with you this morning? There was so much joy that I had in standing there knocking on his window. I really I got a little bit of joy out of doing that. And he jumped and he scrambled. And I looked at him and I said, roll your window down. And now I had to be serious, you know, I had to be the, the serious journeyman. And I said, you want to explain what you're doing to me? Oh, well, I was, I was waiting and uh, uh, just all silly excuses. I said, look at your phone. And he looked at his phone and he said he was waiting on a phone call. And I said, look at your phone. And like three or four missed calls from yours truly. And I told him in no uncertain terms, I wasn't ugly to him because I, I, I have to kind of pull myself in and realize that this is a young guy, but this is not a place to be a kid. So I was very, I was very direct. I wasn't ugly to him. That's, that's not ever been my style, but I was very direct. I said, this is not going to cut it. This is not going to cut it. You, you better be thanking your lucky stars that it was me that caught you and not somebody else. I said, get your stuff and you're coming with me and we're working together today. And so he got, he got in the car, and I treated him kind of like I would a kid, and I lectured him a little bit. It wasn't ugly. I didn't cuss the boy. I wouldn't do that. But I told him, I said, and I have said this to every young guy that I've ever had the opportunity to tell this to. I, I take it so very seriously. This, this portion of mentoring to me is so important. Somebody told me this a long time ago, and I've tried to live by this. I said to him, you need to hear what I'm saying. You need to make yourself available to help people. First of all, it's your job. right? You're an apprentice. That's your job. We're not here to sleep. If you're not getting enough sleep at night, I don't know what to tell you, buddy. Get to bed a little bit earlier. We're, that's not what we're doing on site. But the big, the big picture, you need to make yourself available to help. Why, you ask? Because there's going to come a point in your life, if you continue doing this, not if, but when, there's going to come a point that you need some help. And if you've made yourself available to others, they're going to come to where you are and they're going to help you out. It's a, it's a beautiful reciprocity that works. It's a, it's a, it's a reciprocating uh, uh, dynamic that if you are available and you work hard and you help when you're in need, people say, I know what that young man's capable of and I know what he did for me and I'm going to do it for him. Well, I want to tell you, church, that we're all in that place here today. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when we hit a low point in our life. We need one another. We need to be available to one another. We're in this together. We're in this together. Galatians 6 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. Somebody say spiritual. spiritual. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You can be in the same boat. Love them. 
Love them back to the Lord. Encourage them back to the Lord. Create an atmosphere of grace where they can find what they need in the presence of the Lord. And remember and consider yourself because you could be in the same position needing restoration. That's what we do together. Together. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We are better together. Why don't you look at your neighbor and look them in the eye. It'd be real awkward with it. Look them right in the eye and tell them, you need me. You need me. Now look at your other neighbor and tell them, I need you. Pastor, I need you. And you need me. Amen. I had the opportunity. I had the mic and I took the opportunity. We're better together. Praise God. Praise God. Anybody grateful for that today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, if Zoe will help me out, if you'll bring in the spiders. Just kidding. Just kidding. The last point that Agor mentions is this, is the spider. The spider. The Bible says that they, they work with their hands and they are found in king's palaces. They work with their hands and they are found in king's. They, specifically, it says, taketh hold with their hands, with her hands, and is found in king's palaces. As industrious and diligent as the ant in the field, the spider can be found working much the same way in our homes in our homes nobody really wants to hear that but whether you like it or not that's true that's true they're as industrious and diligent a worker as an ant is in the field but they can be found in our homes not a readily beloved creature now okay i know that there are people that have Maybe a, a, a tarantula in an aquarium at their house. And, and those people are insane. They're insane. They're crazy. If you have a tarantula at your house, I'm really just playing. Sort of. Sort of. They're not a readily beloved creature. I, I, I will be in less than 20 days, 40 years old. I feel I am a grown man. And I feel like I am mature in my thinking. And I'm very rational. And I um, uh, make mistakes. We all make mistakes. But I feel like I, Brother Don, really make a good faith effort to try to try to be logical, try to have sound wisdom in everything that I do. You know, I want to be there for my girls, my wife. I have responsibilities for the community that I'm a part of, my church, my, my co-workers, those young guys that I have to lecture and mentor. In my, I, I want to, I'm a grown man, and I try to deal with things logically and sensibly. And I am not afraid of spiders. I'm not. I'm not afraid of snakes. Now, you ask my daughter, she is scared that you don't even talk about them. Don't even show them a picture. Madison doesn't even want to see a picture of a snake. But a snake and a spider, I could put those in the same category. I'm not afraid of them. And if I see one, I, I, have, I have respect for it. You know, I'm not, I'm not foolish. Again, I'm a grown man. I'm mature in my thinking. I use sound logic. And I don't go poke it with a stick. I don't go play with it. If I see a large spider, if I see a snake, I can appreciate what it is from a distance and I can go on my way but if I come across a snake or a spider unexpectedly I turn into a schoolgirl and I scream and I hate that about myself I don't really scream but I come alive I've never been a dancer but in that moment I learn I learn a two-step really quick all logic goes out the window when you come across the spider unexpectedly can I get an amen? amen? They're not a readily beloved creature. 
might even go out of our way to remove them with extreme prejudice if they are found in our homes. I've been there. A good rolled up newspaper. Do they even still make newspapers? Get, get, my, get my newspaper and hit it with it. Back of a shoe, heel of a shoe. We go out of our way to remove those creepy crawlies from our homes. They're not exactly a beloved creature, but, but they are an unassuming, humble creature, diligently and artfully crafting their webs, often unobserved by most people. Now, when you notice a spider in its big old web, you notice it. In fact, it's hard to look away from it. But most of the time, we don't even see it. We don't even notice it. Several years ago, I... <laughs> Brother Mike Bedare asked me to put air conditioning equipment in their new home out in, in Orange. Orange Field, Orange area where they're at. And uh, had a, a few system, a couple systems he was putting in, and I was really trying my hardest to be kind and tell him no. I really, I really, I, I'm just being honest now. And I told him this after the fact. He just laughed at me. I really tried to tell Mike Bedare no. And uh, and I said, I said, oh, brother Bedare, yeah, that's that's a man. I can give you some some numbers of some people that can uh, uh, that can help you out with that. And uh, and, uh, and he said, no, nah. he said, I really would like you to do it. And so I told him, I said, I said, listen, Brother Mike, I, I want to help you. I would love to help you. I, I really, with all of my heart, I want to help you. But, you know, that's just, that's really far away. And I get off work and, and I don't want you waiting around on me. It's going to take me a while. And, and he said, oh, well, since you really want to, take all the time you need. That rascal turned it on me, <laughs> and I had, I had nothing to counter with. He said, take all the time you need. In fact, I'll help you with it. I miss him. I miss him. And uh, so I was going out. I get off work, and I load up tools, and I hightail it out there. And I get out there, and I work until dark way past dark he has lights and everything in the house and we're working putting these air conditioning equipment in and and i leave and i go home and i'm just tired and i do the same thing the next night and this you know some nights i can't you know wednesday nights and he understood all that and and so what i would do is i would try my best on saturday mornings to get up early and i would uh i would run out there and i would just spend as much of the day as i could out there and, and get a lot done and um and so I, I, I got up one particular Saturday morning really, really, really early. It was still a little bit dark at my house just before sunrise, and, and I was driving out to their house. And, and I got into Bridge City going down 1442 and uh, right around the Gulf States plant, the Entergy power plant. And uh, the sun was starting to come up, and it was, it was, it was starting to brighten up outside. And I was going down 1442, and uh, just, past, just past the power plant, the sun was peeking out on top of the trees. And it was really just, it was a beautiful morning. It was real crisp in the air. There was dew settling in. And it was just, uh, or maybe going to start drying up here. They'd set, dew had set in overnight. And it was just beautiful drive in the morning. And the sun was just right across the tops of the trees. And from the power plant, to the intersection at 105 in Orangefield. I did the math, look this up, this is 3.3 miles. There are poles along that road all through, uh, I think they call that the Bridgefield area, kind of between Bridge City and, and Orangefield. And it's about right, just shy, or just a little over three and a half miles. And there's power poles on the left-hand side of the road, and the light was on the power poles, and there was a line across the top and another power line about two foot underneath it. And dew had set in, and when I rounded the corner, I can see all the way down those power lines, more spider webs than I have ever seen in my life. 
I've never seen so many spider webs in my entire life. Now, I didn't dance or squeal, but it kind of started making me itch just thinking about it. The light hit it, and they just shone. What's crazy is I had just been there several days before, and I would have noticed that, but I didn't until light hit it just right. They were there the whole time, no doubt, collecting bugs and insects. The entire three and a half miles of power line, nothing but spider webs. You're welcome. Sleep well tonight. We see them in our home and we clear them away. And, and I, I can assure just about anybody here today, unless you're just, you clean every, just every few hours, if you clean your house today, you're going to probably somewhere in one of your corners, you're going to wipe away some cobwebs. Unnoticed before until you really start looking. And I'm coming, I'm coming to a close with this. The spider is uniquely designed with eight legs and the anatomy that it can produce the material for and create webs. They use what they have to create and to do what only they can. No other creatures quite like a spider. Like them, love them, despise them. They are unique little creatures. Ecclesiastes 9 and 10 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Put your whole heart into it, church. No half measures. We have a unique purpose. You have a unique purpose. You have a unique circle of influence. There's people that you can reach that I can never reach. There's people that I can reach that you can never reach. God has purposed something special in your life. You are one of a kind, friend. You are one of a kind. You are special. You are God created with purpose. Somebody say purpose. No one can reach who you can reach. No one can serve the way and in the capacity that you can serve God. No one can worship the way that you worship. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying this because nobody can feel the role that you feel in this church. When you're not here, you're missed. When your worship is absent, it's missed. Nobody can do what you do, church, because you are special. God purpose, God created, God design. Life might feel or might make you feel small or insignificant, but I want to tell you today, if you don't get anything out of this, you are not small and you are not insignificant. Humble and unassuming as you may be, like the spider quietly taking its place in the king's palace, you have a place in the kingdom of God. You're special. You're special. Why don't we give the Lord a hand clap of praise here today? You are unique. You matter. You matter. You matter. The last few moments as I come to a close, I want to say this again and, and make sure that everybody understands this. You matter. You matter to the kingdom of God. You matter to this church. You matter to your family. You matter to your neighborhood. You matter in the things that count. And I don't want to leave that with just some vague general statement, but I want to expressly state how you matter. You matter in prayer. Your prayer matters. Your worship matters. Your witness. Your witness, your testimony matters. It matters. Your giving matters. Not just your money. Your time, your abilities, it matters. Your encouragement and your kindness matters. Somebody said to me one time, if you never know what to say to somebody to encourage them, I'll give you two things. I'll give you two things. Well, I thought of these two things, but somebody said one one time and I never forgot about it. You can never go wrong complimenting somebody's kids. I want you to think about that. You never go wrong telling somebody how wonderful their kids are. What parent doesn't want to hear that? Oh, man, those boys, those are some fine young men. Those girls, those, those are young ladies. What an honor it must be to be their parent. If you don't know how to encourage somebody, talk about their children. 
makes me feel good. And God told me in Bible college, and I'll never forget this, if you run out of things to think about to be kind, look down at their feet. I know that sounds crazy. He said, hear me out, hear me out. He said, tell a lady that she has cute shoes. And I said, no, no. He said, nope, you're missing the big picture. He said, I used to sell shoes at Dillard's ladies' department. And he said, and when I told those ladies they had cute shoes, they just lit up. Now, he said, I'm not saying women are shallow, but it means something. It means something. When you value what they value, it means something. He said, I went on to sell cars. And I sold more cars to women than anybody I ever worked because the first thing I would say when a lady walked up to me is, man, those are some cute shoes. He said, you value what they value, and now you can tell them and they'll hear what you have to say. Your kindness matters. I know that's silly, but your kindness matters. You matter. Let's lift our hands in this place this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence once again to break the word, to break the bread of life, to dive into your word. Lord, we give you praise. Lord, we enter into worship today, God, with our hearts open and our hands lifted and our voice crying out to you. Lord, come inhabit our praises today, Jesus. We're quick to give you the praise and the honor and the glory that you're so very worthy of. Why don't we clap our hands and enter into worship right now? Come on, why don't we make a joyful noise into the Lord? Why don't we stand to our feet and lift our hands and magnify the name of Jesus? Hallelujah.
you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. I'd like to thank this church for sending my wife and I on this cruise. We had 45 ministers and their wives there, a total of about 90. And I'm going to tell you, it's probably the most enjoyable thing that we've ever done. We had a great, great time. Yeah, we really did. I didn't get seasick. I could have been a sailor. <laughs> Something I learned about me that I never knew, I could have been a sailor. Now, for my wife, that's a different story. She still got her patch on today because she took it off and everything got to spinning and she put it back on and it went away. So she may have to wear the patch the rest of her life. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm the one that everybody was saying would get sick. Didn't happen. It didn't happen. It's just a wonderful time now. Two things. First of all, I'm not going to look at no woman's feet and tell her her shoes look good. <laughs> My wife wouldn't like that too much. Amen. I was sitting there when Brother Babb was talking about that young man sleeping. Uh, my friend, his wife had passed away, and we bumped into another friend we grew up with at camp meeting. And this friend we bumped into was saying, well, you know, I, I would have called you, but I didn't have your number. And my buddy pulled his phone out and looked on there and hit call. And his phone got to ringing, and he answered it. He, he grabbed it. He said, well, that's you. Call me right now. He said, yeah, you had my number. You had my number. You could have called me. You just chose not to. <laughs> the downfalls of cell phones. Amen. Amen. You just can't get by with anything anymore. But what a great, great lesson this morning Brother Matt did. Amen. Amen. Great lesson. Great word. Amen. I really feel like this is working. The 10, 10, 45, and then I feel like it's working now. I've always said that I'm not going to come to this pulpit half-cocked. And I knew that I wasn't, didn't know what to expect getting off of that cruise liner yesterday and how long it would taken all that. And one old guy had his alcohol that he bought in Mexico with him, and he dropped his tote bag, I guess, and it was in there, and it busted. And and I felt like running up to him and saying, well, that's God talking to you. You didn't need it anyway. <laughs> he, he was smiling when he was walking off with it, but when he busted it, he was one, one, unhappy, one, one unhappy cruiser. Amen. So, uh, but it was great. It, it, was, it was really, really wonderful. And I tell you what, if you hadn't gone on one, go on one before you die. You scratch it off your bucket list. But just getting off of that cruise liner, it, it was not that bad. We got off by 8, 8.30. We was on our way home, home at 10.30 yesterday. I said I'd never come to the pulpit half-cocked, and I knew being out there that I wasn't going to have the time to put in. So Brother Matt's going to do a doubleheader today. So, amen. He's going to do a doubleheader because I'm not preaching because I'm half-cocked this morning. Amen. I'm still on the waves. That thing got to rocking at night, and I felt like I was back home in my grandma's lap as a baby being rocked. Didn't bother me one bit. Amen. And my wife's laying over there. Is this, is this thing moving? I said, it's moving. <laughs> it's moving. Thank the Lord. But she did great. She really did great. Amen. Just, just a wonderful time. A fellowship with friends we had there. And, amen. Just a great time. Let's pray today for Sister Pamela Adcock. She really needs a miracle from the Lord. Sister Barbara Tate needs prayer. Shepherd Smith, Cat Griffith, pray for her. Amen. There's so many needs. There's so much sickness in the world right now. Just a lot of people going through, going through the struggle. Man, Sister Donna Patterson needs a touch. Uh, she's been in the hospital 
sent me an inbox the other day really needing a touch from the Lord. If you have a need, just slip up your hand. God knows every need. Why don't we stand and pray today? Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your blessings upon us as the people of God. Every name that we brought before the throne, we pray that you would supply the need this morning. We're believing you for miracles. You're a miracle-given God. Believe in you for signs, wonders, and miracles. We need to be about the Master's business today. We've got a short time to get done what needs to be done. We know you're soon to come. We're expecting you to return to this earth any day. Pray that you would do the miraculous this morning. Touch us today by the mighty power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. God bless you. You can be seated. I want our ushers to come. I'm going to change it up a little bit this morning. We don't want to get stagnated. Amen. I want our ushers to come. You can go online and go portnatureschurch.com. The Lord will bless you. Amen. It's blessed today in Jesus' name. God bless you as you give as unto the Lord. It's that wonderful name. Oh, it's that wonderful name.
special in store for us for this service amen i'm so grateful for the opportunity to to teach and to preach today or certainly do my best to amen good to have caesar with us this morning amen. he came walking in and at first i had, I had a double take i wasn't sure who that who that real tall young man was i declare every time caesar comes in here he's about four or five inches taller just about every time he comes in so good to, good to see caesar this morning that's my buddy amen Amen. I would like to uh, start off this morning um, before I even get into Scripture, and I would like to collectively tell every lady here that her shoes are cute today. <laughs> every lady, your shoes are cute. And I have no problem. I have no problem saying that, Brother Lee. I have no problem saying that. I Coincidentally, I asked that young man that told me that all those years ago in Bible college, I said, I said, well, you do that with the ladies. He said, I asked him, I said, does it, does it work with, with men? And he kind of shook his head. He said, no, it doesn't work with men. And he said, well, let me ask you. He said, if some guy came up to you and said your shoes were cute, would you really want to hear anything he had to say? Point taken, point taken. So, so guys, you're on your own. Ladies, your shoes are cute this morning. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Revelation chapter 22. <laughs> Amen. Get right into the Word. Praise God. Praise God. I, uh, I spent the afternoon uh, yesterday, a good portion of the day, uh, early in the day even, getting together all the, the things I wanted to talk about today. And um, um, all afternoon I got together what I wanted to teach this morning, but I was, I was struggling to put this together. I had a, a thought that the Lord laid in my heart. And I wrote a couple scriptures down, and um, and I didn't. And usually by Sunday evening, if I'm going to preach on, rather by Saturday evening, if I'm going to preach Sunday morning, I have just about everything 
ready to go get up in the morning and refresh my mind. But I didn't really have a clear-cut direction. And, and I don't say this as in validating spirituality or anything like that. I felt I, I was, woke up at 3 o'clock this morning, and I felt exactly what the Lord wanted me to tell wanted me to speak today. I felt like he laid it on my heart. So with the help of the Lord, I want to want to preach today from Revelation chapter 22. I don't I don't intend to go very long today, but I definitely want to share this this word. Revelation chapter 22 verse number 10. The Bible says, "And he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book." For the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And Jesus said these words, And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Amen. Amen kind of feel like that guy I was talking about that wrote in Proverbs Agor this morning I'm I'm nothing and I need him I I need Jesus today so we're just going to trust the Lord to speak to us through his word more than we need anything we need to hear from the Lord today more than our programs more than our services we need to hear from the Lord today why don't you lift your hands and pray that with me right now Lord Jesus we love you mighty God we're so very grateful for this opportunity that you've given us to come into your presence once again mighty God we need you here today God we need direction for our life here today Lord we need a word from you here today lord we ask that you would move in a mighty way lord that your that your spirit and your presence would abound in this place lord i pray that your anointing would come into this house lord that it would anoint our hearts and our minds to be receptive of your word here today lord we love you and we thank you for what you're done what you've done and for what you're gonna do and we pray all these things in the wonderful name that's above every name and the whole church said in jesus name why don't you give the lord a hand clap of praise Hallelujah. Praise God. You can be seated. Lord bless you. Profound statement, if there ever was one, whatever will be, will be. There was a song that was a, turned into a hit in the mid-50s. And it was from the Italian uh, philosophical phrase, che sarà, sarà, whatever will be, will be. Now this was from a perspective of fate, that we have no control over the fates. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Whatever will be, will be. I can get on board with that statement, whatever will be, will be, when it's in God's will. So I can say it like this, whatever will be, God's will will be. Can I get an amen in this house this morning? Do you believe that God cares about what you're doing and what's going on in your life and where you're going? If you believe that, why don't you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Praise God. Whatever will be, will be. The concept of predestination from a Calvinist perspective could grab hold of this scripture that we read in verse number 11 and try to build their doctrine out of it. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. But he that is righteous and he that is holy is going to be righteous and going to be holy. And that's as far as it has to go. This this predestination idea can stop right there. 
But if you take into account verse number 10 when it says, and this is how we have to view this, in, in light of verse number 10 when it says, He saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Keep the book open. Keep the book open is what the Word of God is saying. And you view it in light of verse number 17, the Bible goes on to say, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is athirst, Come. And whosoever will, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. I want to tell you, friend, that if you're going to be filthy, you're going to be filthy. If you're going to be unjust, you're going to be unjust. But if you've made up in your mind that you're going to strive for righteousness, that you're going to strive for holiness, that's what you ought to do in this hour. What will be, will be at the end of the day. When it's all said and done, at the, at the, when we take our last breath, or when the Lord splits the eastern sky and says time will be no more, and He comes again, what will be in that moment will be. The unjust will be unjust. The filthy will be filthy. But the holy and the righteous will be holy and righteous. What will be will be. But I want to tell you, and I want to give you some hope this morning. What is, I'm not talking about then, I'm talking about now. What is, doesn't have to be what is. Somebody hear what I'm saying this morning. You ever heard somebody say, well it is what it is. No, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. If you came here this morning and you're struggling, friend, I want to tell you, you don't have to struggle anymore. If you came here this morning and you're hurting, I want to tell somebody today, you don't have to hurt anymore. If you came here this morning and you're sick in your body, friend, you don't have to be sick in your body anymore. If you walked in the doors this morning and you've got anxiety in your heart and in your mind, friend, you don't have to leave this place with anxiety anymore. Does anybody believe in the power of the Holy Ghost? Come on, one God apostolic tongue-talking holiness church. Do you believe in the power of the Holy Ghost? Do you believe that He can still heal? Come on, if you believe that, why don't you shout amen? Do you believe that He can deliver? If you believe that, why don't you shout amen? Do you believe that those that don't have hope can come to this house and find hope? If you believe that, why don't you stand to your feet and clap your hands and say, Yes, Lord, I believe. Come on, the world might say it is what it is, but we've come to the house of God this morning. And what you came with, you don't have to leave with. What you came with today, you don't have to leave with. Lift your hands and worship Him today. Jesus it doesn't have to be what it is anybody believe in repentance today come on do you truly believe in repentance today that means turning around and doing different what you did before repentance is owning the failure and changing the trajectory of your life. Lord, I haven't been going the right way. And I repent. But part of that means I'm going to go the other way. Somebody hear what I'm saying today. It doesn't have to be what it is. Keep the book open. Keep the book open. Romans chapter 13 says, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering, which is sexual immorality, not in wantonness, which is extreme indulgence, and not in strife and envying, 
but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Don't set yourself up for failure is what the Word of God is saying. Don't put yourself in a position where you're going to fall on your face. Don't set yourself up for failure, but put safeguards in your life to keep you from messing up. Safeguards require a little extra work. It's a little more effort on our part. But if you don't have them, it's a little too late when the damage is done. There's a guy I used to work with that um, he was a framer before he did air conditioning work. And when we were crawling around in attics years ago, and, and every once in a while we'd have to frame something up, get some two-by-fours, and he was, he was good. He was good at what he did. He said, man, I framed a bunch of houses. And he said, I still have my framing tools. And he went and got a, a saw, and he took every safety off of that thing. And I watched him when he used it. He'd cut it, and he'd run through it. And as he cut through it, he let it go from his hand and he grabbed the cord and slid it to a stop and dropped it in the dirt as it was still spinning. And I watched him do that over and over again. And I was telling somebody about work about that. I said, man, I didn't want to work with that guy. He took every safety guard off of it. He clearly knew what he was doing to a point. But how long are you going to play those games until you get hurt? My buddy at work said, you know, my grandpa did the same thing. He said he'd cut and then he'd grab it by the, by the cord and he'd spin it and he'd drop it behind him. He said he grabbed it by the cord one day and he flung it right into his leg while it was still spinning. It's too late to put safeguards in your life. When the damage is done, somebody hear me what I'm saying today. Keep the book open. Keep the book open. Oh, we got to hear from God. We got to hear from God, church. Put on Jesus. Take him with you wherever you go. Let him be your covering in everything that you do. Let him be your covering in your home, in your family, in your marriage, on the job, when you're at school, when you go out and about, when you're with your friends, in your community. Put on Jesus Christ. Let him be your covering. Jesus is sufficient. Do you believe that today? He's all we need. He's all we need. I shared this morning in Proverbs chapter 3, I talked about Agor, the writer of this scripture, this chapter in, in Proverbs, and he made a very bold prayer in the midst of Proverbs chapter 30, a very bold prayer, and he asked God for two things, two very specific things, and and as I was reading through, I kept going back to that, Brother Lee. I kept looking at that over and over again. And my mind kept being drawn right back to that, that prayer that he made, those two things he asked of God. And he was very bold in his asking. Humble he was before God, saying, I can't do anything. I am most brutish. I am stupid. I need you, Lord. He was humble before God, but in his prayer, he asked God with boldness these two things. He said, these two things have I required of thee, O God? Deny me them not before I die. Agor said, God, I'm asking two things of you, and I ask that you give me these things before I die. I wish that the church of the living God would, would turn to prayer in this hour with the idea that our morality is a very real thing, and our mortality is a very real thing. There's going to be an end to all of this. There's going, to, there's going to come an end to all of this. There's going, to be a, there's going to be a moment where time is no more. And Agor said, understanding that I'm going to die. But before I do, Lord, I ask that you would give me these two things. And he prayed. He prayed and, and asked God. He understood that we are only given a finite amount of time to get done what we need to get done. And he said, Lord, remove far from me 
vanities and lies. The self-sufficiency, that's what a vanity is. You're vain if you think that you can do it by yourself. You're quite full of yourself. I'm quite full of myself if I think I can do it by myself. These vanities, these pointless endeavors, a life without purpose, hiding the truth from even ourselves. He said, Lord, remove far from me the vanities and the lies, lying to others and lying to myself. And he said this, the second thing, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me just enough. Give me just enough. Lord, give me just enough. I'm not asking for a big banking account because he said, I know my heart, God. If I have an abundance, I won't think that I need you anymore, God. And I need you. Anybody blessed here today? It's because of Jesus. Let's not kid ourselves today. It's because of him. You're blessed today because it's a blessing that he gave you. Agor said, give me just enough. Just enough to fill my mouth. Just enough to fill my belly. He said, Lord, I don't want to be rich. That I would turn my heart from you. That I would deny you. And Lord, I don't want to be so poor in poverty that I would steal to get what I need. And that my actions would profane you. He said, but you are all I need. Church, we've got to get to the point in our life where that is it. That is it. Lord, you are all that I need. Take this whole world and give me Jesus. Lord, I've been trying it on my own for too long, God. And I can only go so far by myself, Lord. But you are all that I need. Could you lift your hands in this place? Come on, could you let him be your sufficiency this morning? Could he be your sufficiency this morning? He said, Lord, I want to live in the truth and I want just enough to get me where I'm going. I want to live in the truth. The truth is, church, that that truth is not subjective. We don't live our truths. This is, this is a big, it's a big thing. It's a big push in our world today. Oh, live out your truth. It's not your truth. Truth is not subjective to the individual. Truth is objective and it is absolute. And the truth is that Jesus is enough. Somebody hear what I'm saying today. If you don't get anything else, I want you to hear these words. Jesus is enough. Stop looking elsewhere. Jesus is enough. He's all that we need. The truth is there will be a time when it's too late for repentance. There will be a time when the filthy is going to be filthy. And the unjust is going to be unjust. There's a time when repentance will not be available. Whatever will be in that moment will be. Why don't we lift our hands in this place this morning? That window of opportunity is open right now, church. We just have to leave the book open. Truth is available and hope is available if we leave the book open, if we leave our hearts open, if we make ourselves available to that hope and to that truth. Come on, Jesus is enough. He's all that we need. He's all that we need. We earnestly pray His kingdom come and we say these words, Lord, let Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But I want to tell you, until His kingdom does come, we must work until it happens. It's not our place to call it. It's not our place to say this is it, this is done. It's our place to fill it. And what I'm talking about is the house of God. So this is the word that I want to give you this morning. That we would strive to fill the house of God threefold as the musicians would get ready to come and we're going to close service out. But I want you to hear what the Lord gave me to tell you this morning. That it is our place to fill the house threefold with people, with prayer, and with praise. 
I got Bible for it. I'm going to read some scripture and then we're going to lift our hands and we're going to worship the Lord this morning. He has called us to fill the house with people. With people. What are we doing if we've been redeemed and we don't tell anybody about it? What are we doing? What are we doing? Fill his house with people. With people. Luke 14 says, The Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Fill his house with people, church. With people. Somebody say people. People are hurting. People are broken. People are lost. And they need the message that comes from this book that we've got to keep open. That we've got to keep open. Fill his house with people. Fill his house with prayer. Isaiah 56, even, even then will I bring to my holy mountain, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar. His altars are ready this morning. His altars are ready this morning. They're, the sacrifices are going to be accepted upon my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer. Somebody say prayer. What do we do in church if we're not praying? What are we doing if we're not praying? He goes on to say, The Lord which gathereth the outcasts of Israel saith, Yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. They're coming. They're coming. Because people need prayer. And if we're not a house of prayer, they're going to go right on along because they're not going to find what they're looking for. If this is not a house of prayer, people need prayer. And we've got to do what God has called us to do. Oh, that my house would be called a house of prayer. Jesus flipped over the tables. He turned over the seats. He ran the money changers from the temple. And he said, this is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. I want to tell you, our Lord isn't happy if this is anything but a house of prayer. If we've made this anything else but a house of prayer, friend, we're outside of what the Lord desires for it to be. Does anybody believe that this morning? Your word says it. He ran them out. This is supposed to be a house of prayer. And finally, somebody say praise. Praise ye the Lord. The psalmist said, praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Why don't we lift our hands in this place? Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O ye servants of the Lord. Are there any servants of the Lord in this house this morning? The Bible says, Praise Him, ye that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto His name, for it is pleasant. Why don't we stand to our feet and lift our hands? We've got to fill the house with people. That is what we've been called to do. This has to be a house of prayer. That's what this has been called to be. And let there be praise in his house. That's what the psalmist said to do as he led us in worship. Oh, praise the Lord. Why don't we lift our voice today, this morning? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Come on. Why don't we lift our voice?
Jesus will be accepted at the altar, why don't you make your way to the front this morning? Why don't you do what the man of God said? Your sacrifices will be accepted in this house of prayer. Why don't you come with a sacrifice of praise this morning? Maybe it's been a little while since you just enjoyed the presence of the Lord. Why don't you come ready to worship today? Why don't you come ready to praise the name of Jesus? this real quick Joshua in chapter 3 said this to the children of Israel verse number 5 he said and Joshua said unto the people sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders the Lord will do wonders among you anybody ready for the miraculous in their life Come on, I'm not hyping you today. I'm, I'm really asking, is anybody ready for the Lord to do something in your family? You ready for the Lord to do something in your finances? We, we say these things like these are some just arbitrary things, but these are very real situations. Are you ready for the Lord to touch your heart, to meet you where you are? Joshua said, gather the people together because I've got a message for him. He said, sanctify yourselves. That means get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Make your hearts ready. Make the house of God ready. It's coming. It's coming. Get ready. It's coming, but it hasn't happened yet. Get ready. It's going to happen, but I'm going through a hard time. Get ready. It's going to happen, but my family's not where they need to be. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Come on. Let's worship him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
obey the Lord this morning. We've been talking about unity in the body of Christ and how we need each other. And we're in this together. So before we leave this altar today, I want you to know there's some oil right here. And we're going to pray with you if you want prayer today. We're going to bind together. Nobody has to know what you're going through. But if you've got a need, why don't you come right to the front. We're going to lay hands and we're going to believe God for you today. I don't want this opportunity to pass you by if you've got something going on in your life. Don't come just because you feel you have to. But I don't want to leave unless, unless I obeyed the Lord this morning. Now we're going to bind together for this need. We're going to bind together for these needs. If you want to come, lay your hands on them. If you want to lift your hands right where you are. If we believe everything that we've talked about today, unity in the body, we're going to believe the Lord together. What we're doing is we're creating an atmosphere. We're making ourselves ready for the Lord to do something incredible.
Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Oh, precious Savior. Get ready, church. Get ready. He said, sanctify yourself tomorrow. The Lord will work wonders among you. It may not have happened for you today. But get ready. Get ready. Don't lose the faith. Get ready. The Lord's going to do it. Get ready. Praise God. Why don't you, why don't you lay your hand on your neighbor right, right where you stand, right next to you. We're going we're gonna to pray together as we come to a close of this service today. In unity in the body right now. We're going to pray for one another. Lord Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing, God. I thank you for your precious word here today, mighty God. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship you, Lord, to hear from you, God. Lord, I receive the word that you've given me today, Lord. I receive your word today, mighty God. Lord, that your house would be filled, mighty God, that this would be a house of prayer, Lord, and that praise would be in the temple, Lord. That's what you've called us to do in this hour. We're going to keep that book open. We're going to keep that book open. Lord, we may have come with problems today, but we don't have to leave with problems. We're going to make ourselves available, Lord, sanctifying ourselves to you to do wonders among us, Jesus. Lord, bless, encourage, strengthen, protect, heal, deliver, set free by the power and the authority of the name of Jesus. Pour out your spirit and your power and your glory upon every heart and every life under the sound of my voice today, God. Encourage and strengthen and heal, Lord. Do the miraculous once again, mighty God. I thank you for what you're doing and we give you praise for it today. And we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. If you're praying, you just keep on praying. I want to dismiss the presence of the Lord. If you're praying, keep on praying. Why don't you find somebody on your way out today and hug their neck and tell them you love them and encourage them.